the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. <clears throat> Amen, our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us every day. Thank you for all your blessings, and all your love, and your care for us. We ask you, O Lord, today to open our hearts and eyes for our understanding, to receive your word, joy and understanding and not on, only understanding but also to give us wisdom and strength in order to apply your word in our daily life protect the church and protect your children in the church from every evil around us in the world save the minds and hearts of our youth from the evil thoughts surrounding them in the world and bless the church, keep her safe, and bless every step of the church, bless Abuna, and all the servants of the church, and all the congregation, and fill our hearts with love to each other and to you. And uh, stay with us <clears throat> through the road, Lord, until the end, because we cannot walk alone without you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Through the intercession of St. Mary and our holy saints and martyrs and Archangel Michael and the blessed nativity fast and the mighty powerful love given cross, please, O Lord, make us ready to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All righty. Let's go ahead and uh, get started. As it is our tradition, um, we're going to do a quick review over um, chapter 25 that we covered last week. And uh, by all means, feel free to jump in if you have any questions or comments or anything. Uh, just a quick little uh, points from what we covered last week. Uh, the, this whole chapter was like uh, finally after all the warnings and the various to the various nations that God has given, from like chapter twenty three to twenty two, and then in in uh, and in twenty uh, uh, four, uh, God gave the warning to the whole world, to the whole earth. Now we shift kind of in focus a little bit to the song of victory and praise. <clears throat> And it starts right away from verse 1 in chapter 25 with Isaiah, with Isaiah saying, O oh Lord, you are my God. Remember that million dollar question we talked about, which is, are you able to say to God these same words? O oh Lord, you are my God. Is, is your relationship with God because of your family, because of your upbringing, because of your culture, because of, of what your church or is it a personal thing is it your choice do you own your christianity personally um and we talked about how it's it's really imperative that we get our youth that we serve in the sunday schools at a certain point in time to get them to make that choice for themselves not because their parents make them or the sunday school servants or abuna or the church or whatever and then we talked about that uh, a little bit about the name of the lord and how powerful it is and how it is like everyone's desire we talked about proverbs eighteen ten. the name of the lord is a strong tower the righteous runs to it and is safe and is protected um and and how the best form of prayer and simultaneously it is the best antidepressant in my opinion and the best anti-anxiety medicine and the best insomnia treatment is simply to recall and to describe who god is and what he did and what he does in our life. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we, after that, we shifted a little bit focus on about how every single thing that God has said he would do, he did. And how we may begin to walk with God now or at a certain point in our life, but he has been working on us from of old. And everything he has promised or declared from of old has come to fruition. And, and then after that, we talked about how the power of evil and darkness will be no more. As Kathy said, there's no sequels. Um, 
Then we talked about how there will come a point when all people, everybody, actually not just people, all people and all spirits, whether they're believers or unbelievers, will bow before the Lord, whether they like it or not. Of course, those who are walking with God will bow before the Lord with joy and delight and excitement and enthusiasm. And <clears throat> the other ones are going to bow before the Lord with fear and terror and dreading what's about to come their way. Um, then we talked a little bit about the poor and the needy. And we said, who are the poor and who are the needy? It wasn't just physically poor and needy, but the poor are the poor in spirit. Those who realize that they own nothing, they have nothing, that all they have and all they are is his and from him and for him. So uh, these, those are the poor people. And then th th that he will give strength. He will be their strength. And then the needy people are basically those that are humble, those who know I cannot do it alone. Without God, it is impossible for me to do anything, like John 15, 5. Those, those whose prayer is often, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need your mercy. I need your strength. I need your enlightenment. I need you to make me holy. I need you to make me like your son. I need you to make me grow and live, uh, to live and do anything good in my life, etc. Those are the needy. They feel like they really need God in every day and every aspect of their life. Um, then after that, we talked about that. Remember uh, the analogy of God and the policeman, how how we live our life determines how we view God, and 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 who God is to us. And it's and we we took that. I mean, it's a lame analogy, but yeah, it it will kind of drive the point, which is those who follow the law and live according to the law and everything, they view the policeman as their ally as their protection they like the policeman they wave at him like they they're happy he's around or she's around okay but the lawless people those who break the law they hate the policeman they they, they dread him they they look at him as as an opposition as a hurdle something they need to get out of the way so that they can live their lawless life as much as they would like to and and this explains the ever increasing one of the many reasons really for the ever increasing uh, opposing views of God in the world today that are progressively and in increasing and, and, and diametrically opposite to the Christian view of God. They don't just not believe in God, but they actually hate Him and they want to get rid of Him uh, because they want to live life according to however they want and they don't want anybody telling them you shouldn't do this. <clears throat> And then after that, we went to talk about the feast or the banquet that is prepared by God for all people in this mountain. Remember this mountain? This mountain is the church of the New Testament. And we talked about what is the church? The church is not the building. The church is actually, we can say the church is the people, the believers, but on a more like if you put it on the microscope, you can say that the church is that deep and personal an intimate, real, uh, genuine relationship with God. And this feast, the banquet that, that God is preparing for those uh, people, <clears throat> for us, hopefully, it's a feast of choice pieces. It's, it's fulfilling. It's satiating. It makes one fully content and pleased and like really not wanting anything. It makes one rich, like we say in the Kiyah praises, or oh, please make them rich. Not rich as in having everything, but rich as in wanting nothing. Remember that quote, the richest one in the world is not the one who has everything. It's the one who wants nothing. Um, and this feast is not only satiating, but it's a feast of refined wine on the lees, which means it's, it's aged wine on the lees. Lees is the sediment, so it's aged wine, and it ages for so long that the sediments precipitate to the bottom, and the wine is nice good aged wine so it's it's the real deal it's true joy pure joy unadulterated joy free from sediments free from phony stuff it's everlasting joy the complete opposite of the joy of the world or anything from the world that is here today and gone tomorrow and is full of sediment if you will now we talked about how he will swallow death forever and there's like a nice like complete end to death it's not that he will destroy death, that he swallowed death. Death is, you look for it, you can't find it anywhere. Um, and then we saw again yet another example of this nice cohesion and congruency between Isaiah 
in Revelation when he talks about how God will wipe away every tear. And <clears throat> after that, we talked about how uh, God will take away the rebuke of all the people on the cross. And um, it kind of ends with how it says the Lord has spoken, it means that God said it, that settles it. And we ought to just rest in this and rejoice in this and give thanks for this. Um, then we talked for a little bit about waiting for the Lord. Do you remember this? And we said, what does waiting for the Lord look like? And we said it's active waiting. You all remember that? And we said how waiting for the Lord, that means while I'm waiting for God, it's not just I sit like this and I'm waiting, you know, twirling my thumbs. No, I keep, while I'm waiting, I keep living according to God's will. I keep examining my heart to see if there's anything in me that is not according to his will that I need to confess or repent of. I keep feeding myself spiritually. I keep praying and praising and worshiping and thanking and serving and giving. Um, and then also we pointed out how uh, to wait on the Lord means do not resort to other sources of the world or other people. You wait on God himself, okay? Um, <clears throat> you're waiting for God to do something. You're not going to go to others. And then those who wait on the Lord the right way will never be disappointed. They will never be disappointed. And then we close the chapter with... Uh, for on this mountain the handle of the world will rest and we talked about where does god rest and god rests on this mountain in the church in that personal intimate relationship with god in a heart that is directed towards him and remember we we talked about how after creation in genesis when it says god rested it does mean god rested from the work of creation so he stopped creating, he's done, he created everything that there is. But also God rested now that he created man and woman in his image, and now he can rest in that intimate personal relationship we, he has with them. Now God can rest in their heart, not just in his throne. Not rest as in he was restless, but now God can rest as in a, you know, a body, an object is at, at rest, like it's, it lives there, it it's, resides there. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty much all I could recall and highlight from chapter 25. We covered a lot of uh, points, actually. Um, chapter 26 is kind of fun. I have to admit, chapters like 13 to 23 with uh, warnings and, and, and threats and, and all that stuff, even though it had a lot of messages of hope or like, just turn to me and I'll accept you and all that stuff, it was... Um, Kind of heavy, <laughs> but there was a lot of good lessons in it. Okay, so before we start chapter 26, does anybody have any comments or questions or anything? Going once. All righty. Let's read chapter 26. Um, it's, uh, what, 21 verses? Um, so I need someone to read pretty much the whole chapter. Actually, just to, to, through 19. We'll leave a couple of verses to the end. But it's because it was kind of hard to break down this first segment. So we'll read uh, chapter 26 from 1 through 19. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Come closer to the mic a little bit, please. Thank you. <clears throat> In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation, which keeps the truth, may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. For he brings down those who dwell on high, the lofty city, he lays it low. He lays it low to the ground. He brings it down to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. O most upright, you weigh the path of the just. Yes, in the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you. The desire of our soul is for your name and for the remembrance of you. With my soul, I have desired you in the night. Yes, in my spirit within me, I will seek you early. 
For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let grace be shown to the wicked, yet not, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness he will deal unjustly, and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when your hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they will see and be ashamed for their envy of people. Yes, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. Lord, <clears throat> you will establish peace for us, for you have also done all our works in us. O Lord our God, masters besides you, wait, O Lord our God, masters besides you have had dominion over us. But by your but by you only we make mention of your name. They are dead, they will not live. They are deceased, they will not rise. Therefore you have punished and destroyed them, and made all their memory to perish. You have increased the nation, O Lord, you have increased the nation. You are glorified. You have expanded all the borders of the land. O Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. As a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pangs, when she draws near the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Your dead shall live, together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. O oh, glory be to the Holy Trinity, our God, for amen. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Let's dive in. Again, feel free to jump in any time if you have any questions or, or comments or anything. Right away, verse 1 begins with that famous phrase that we've been reading a lot in Isaiah. In that day. Okay? And you go in what day? And you go, that's the day that's mentioned actually in the previous chapter, chapter 25. When God will avenge his people and will set them free and will save them. That's the day when God will wipe away every tear. Now, now, which is actually, you can look at it, as we've said before, the prophecies of Isaiah, there were three segments, I guess, of time. When, when these prophecies would come to fruition, one was like the immediate future, which is anywhere from 100 to 200 years or something like that, after he said what he said. And the first coming at the incarnation of the Lord, which also happened and came to fruition, and then also at the second coming of the Lord. So you can use that day to apply to any of those most of the time. <clears throat> now, what's what's going to happen on that day? The song will be sung. Notice that once the day begins, there's no more time. So when this song begins, when we, if we're referring to this that day as in the second coming, once that day, once the second coming begins, then there's no more time anymore. So when this song begins, what does this mean? The song keeps going. Okay, it's it's a song like it doesn't end. This is the the song sung in the church, the song of the New Testament, um, and 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 the song begins with the words God will appoint salvation. Actually, in Arabic, it's a little bit better because it shows the verb a little bit better. It says God appoints salvation, not will appoint salvation. It's it's a it's a present continuous verb. It's not future. Um, and God becomes our strength within us and our strength as a wall around us. So it's a strength from within and a, like a shelter, a protection, a shield, a strength from within and a protection from, from without. And then in verse two, it says, open the gates. Does that sound familiar? Like the Psalm, right? Um, it says, okay, open the gates that the righteous nation, which keeps the truth may enter. Open which gates? The gate to heaven? The gates of heaven. The heavenly gates. Uh, among also the gates of Jerusalem when they go back uh, after uh, the oppression. But yeah, we're focusing here on the heavenly gates. And how can the believers demand gates of heaven to be open? 
right? It said, open the gates. It's not like, you know, please the Lord open the gates for us or something like that. They say it with, with confidence. How can the, the, the believers just demand that the gates of heaven be opened? Because they all put on Christ. So the heavenly gatekeepers, if they will, when they see the believers, who do they see? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we put on Christ when we are baptized. And that's how we're able to enter because God sees his son in us. Um, also notice in verse 2, what makes the believers to be called the righteous nation? It says, open the gates that the righteous nation may enter. The blood of Christ. Okay. I mean, the blood of Christ was shed for everybody. Which keeps the truth. Are you, uh, that's it. It's right there in the verse. What makes them to be called the righteous nation is the fact that they keep the truth. Okay, let's pause here for a minute and go deeper on that word. What does keeping the truth mean for us? It means many things. Hold on to Christ. Hold on to Christ. Okay. That's okay. That's it. Following his commandments. Listen, it's very important for us to know what is keeping the truth so that we can enter, right? So we can go open the gates. Yes, following his commandments. Yeah. Freed, freed from sins. And humbled. Mm -hmm. I guess it maybe it's that's more of a result. Okay. Um, so keeping the truth means me, me, many things. Number one, it means seeking the truth. Okay. Uh, th these are these are the things we need to do in order to be people who have the title of those who keep the truth, seeking the truth, okay. And number two, which is like what you guys were were hinting towards, is that keeping it in our hearts, or like like, um, yeah. In Arabic, it's it's more more clear. It says al hafiz al amana, keeping the truth. I mean, it's like memorizing the truth. When you keep something in your heart, like you're memorizing it, and then. It also means keeping the truth in their life, like applying the truth in their life, living by the truth. And keeping the truth also means protecting the truth from the crazy wrong ideology of the world that's going on all over the place right now from all sides. <clears throat> this is a way of keeping the truth. Um, as in the faith keepers as in our church fathers that we commemorate in every liturgy and 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 in, and in the absolution of the servants uh, by the way i don't know if you know this or not but when abuna prays may your servants the ministers of this day my fathers and brethren the deacons the clergy and our people be absolved from the mouth of the holy trinity the father son and the holy spirit the mouth of the church and the mouth of what who do we say our father uh uh, Dioscorus, Saint Athanasius, Saint Peter the Apostol, uh, uh, the the Holy Martin, High Priest, Saint John Chrysostom, Saint Cyril, Saint Basil, Saint Gregory. Why why those people? And then the Council, right? The three hundred eighteen Council of uh, Nicaea, the, the two hundred fifty Constantinople, the one hundred fifty Constantinople, and the two hundred Ephesus. Why those? Why not Saint George, Saint Mina, Saint Saint Mary? The, these are the keeper of the faith. Exactly. They are defended the faith. Yes, these are the ones that. They kept the faith for us, okay? So those who keep the faith includes protecting the truth from the crazy ideology out there. When something comes out, we don't just say, whatever, that's your truth for you. That's not what I believe, but okay, no. We say, no, this is the truth, dot, 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 dot. Um, especially with our youth and kids who are, God bless them, are bombarded from all sides with all kinds of crazy stuff. Also, keeping the truth means diligently doing their best their best to pass that same unadulterated truth 
without adding anything to it and without subtracting anything to it from it to future generations okay do you remember that famous uh quote that pope shenouda said about it. keeping the faith what is it Trafat? said if if by the end of my papacy i deliver the church the exact same way i received it i would consider it accepted. yes he said if all i do is just deliver to the next generation the faith that i received i didn't do anything else i'll consider myself a very successful uh, uh pope um so diligently uh, doing our best to pass that same truth without adding or taking away from it to the future generations and then lastly keeping the truth means teaching the future generations to do the same so all the stuff we mentioned now telling them or passing on to them the baton to keep the truth also so so i want to know like what is keeping the truth tell me exactly Keda carefully and i don't think we even covered all of it but i i thought it was very important that we talk about what is keeping the truth because it was those who can boldly with with uh, favor Keda, with confidence say open the gates <laughs> and then the gates will open for them and what is the truth or maybe i should ask Jesus it? Christ, yes. Jesus Christ. Yeah, he said, I am the truth. This is very important that we remember this. Anytime you are tempted to lie or to twist things a little bit or to fib or to call it whatever you want to call it. Okay, remember that once I take out the truth, I'm taking out God out of the formula. I'm taking Jesus out of the formula. Whether I lie on my taxes, whether I lie in my work, whether I lie to my spouse, whether I lie in a conversation, I'm just taking God out. Um, okay, verse 3 it says, You will, uh, I know you all love this verse, you will keep him in perfect peace. By the way, him is again, it's just the language translation. This you, you will keep the one in perfect peace, so it's him or her. Can you describe to me what you think perfect peace looks like? Lasting peace, everlasting peace. A lot of a lot of things, a lot of great things. Peace that does not depend on the circumstances. Okay, very good. It does not depend on the circumstances. It's like steadfast peace. It's like I like the image of Psalm one, the tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season. It, its leaf does not wither. That's awesome. Regardless of the conditions, it's, it's continuously fed and it's continuously bearing fruit in its right time. Doesn't worry. Is that peace? Doesn't have to worry about or fear droughts because it's by the stream. So I'm continuously nourished. Hey, tell me more. Perfect peace. Okay, I'll throw some at you and you all can like jump in with, with more. Rafat was about to say one. Uh, I think the perfect peace or the godly peace does not only affect the emotion, but affect the whole life, the whole person, the deeds and the words and everything. Yes, it comes out, it shows. Mariam, you're going to say something? Yes. Uh, God created us on his image and he's perfect so I think if we keep trying to be as our God Jesus Christ as much as we can so we will be perfect peace okay there's also is all the understanding yes, yes. Uh, so say that again Rehem surpasses all our understanding very nice so it's like a peace that we can have even while in the midst of a storm even while going through all kinds of madness that anyone else who's not walking with God would like be freaking out. This person, it, it doesn't make sense. It surpasses understanding. It's inexplicable peace. Very good. Dr. Philippe? I was about to say the exact the same what Sir said. Okay. Yeah. So it is, okay, perfect peace. I want to know what perfect peace is because like this is what, what God will keep me in if I walk with him. So it's peace without like while going through the storms you've said this one peace that is independent of the happenstances of life y'all said that one too um it's internal peace 
that manifests itself externally too. I think y'all said that one as well. Perfect peace is contagious peace. Meaning when people are around such a person, they also begin to feel that peace. Have you met somebody in your life that, that when you're in, in their presence, maybe even the first time you met them, you just like you feel peace. It's like, yeah, I want to be next to this person. We don't even have to talk. I feel peace. Uh, so it's contagious peace. It is, I'll call it attractive uh, uh, evangelical peace, meaning those who see it want it. Those who see it, they desire it. Even unbelievers. Uh, and this is how it is also evangelical because it attracts other to true Christianity. Uh, perfect peace. It's everlasting peace. Y'all mentioned that one. It's peace that cannot be stolen. So no matter what happens, nothing can snatch it away. Inexplicable. Um, perfect peace also, it's a peace of the conscience. No guilt. You know when somebody's like, you know, you've done something that you kind of like wish you didn't and like you feel guilt inside or like your conscience is kind of tagging at, tugging at your, at your heart. So perfect peace, it's a peace of the conscience as well. Um, perfect peace, it's a stable peace. Not so much, uh, you've mentioned this one, like not so much up and down, up and down, depending on what goes on. Like when one thing can take me over the moon and like one thing can slam me down into the pits. No, it's like ongoing. Um, also perfect peace. We didn't mention this one. It's peace that is from God. Notice that it says what? You, O oh God, will keep him in perfect peace. Or will keep them in perfect peace so it's not a peace that i can make happen for myself it's not a peace that i can get from anywhere other than god um can i say something abuna uh -huh. uh, if i remember all his promises in the whole bible i'll be really super super more than perfect peace uh, yes but i want to i want to tweak what you said just a little bit so, like I've said this before in some of the sermons, that the Bible has 7,000 promises in it. And they're like really awesome promises, okay? But every promise has a premise. Every promise has a premise. Every promise has a condition. So, I guess when I recall all the promises of God, and I, with all my heart and diligence, trying to do the premises of those promises, then yeah then I can be at peace. Okay. Whom will God keep in perfect peace? Those who surrender their life to him. It says it right there in the verse. Whose mind stayed on God. Those whose mind is stayed on you. What does this mean? What does a mind who is stayed on on God look like focused okay submission yeah um Abuna uh -huh. can I answer it in like in an analogy kind of thing sure um I know like when I'm watching like a new movie or a movie that I really like when I'm watching it, it's like nothing else in the world is happening. So I'm picturing just us looking at God and just right. nothing else in the world matters. Very good. Absolutely focused. Okay. <clears throat> My wife just learned the Jesus prayer this week. And so she was just telling me that focusing on, on the prayer and going through it and we're going through scripture over and over again, even if it's just to stay your mind on God, that's the work, I guess. Awesome. I'm glad you said that because we're going to talk about actually that exactly in just a little bit. So, okay, <laughs> a mind that is stayed on God, what it looks like is that it's a mind that it's, y'all said most of this stuff already. It's a mind that is fixed on God, always looking at God. It's a mind that is mindful of God or like you can say fearing God, always aware that whatever I say, whatever I do, I'm saying it or doing it in front of God. Um, not because I'm, I'm afraid he's going to zap me, but I'm like, I'm considering God in whatever I do or say, whatever you do, do unto the Lord. Okay. 
it's a like Luigi said it's a focused goal oriented mind a mind that does not allow distractions or 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 fall for them it's kind of like uh, the the I'll mention another analogy if you've watched any documentary or National Geographic or Blue Planet or or whatever but it's the like the eyes of like a lion or or cheetah or tiger when they're looking at the prey right like no matter what happens they're like completely focused on it it's a mind a mind that stayed on god is a mind that always measures their actions to god's standards it's a mind that always asks itself what does god think of what i'm saying or doing what does god want me to say or do um does not matter what the world standards are what the other people's standards are or opinions are um also it is a mind that is committed to god and always puts god first that's the mind that stayed on, on god and why would anyone's mind be stayed on god all the time like this it says it in the verse because they trust god okay you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you why because he trusts in you that's why it is of utmost important to have that personal intimate relationship with god that we keep talking about because you need to get to know god and when you get to know god i mean no no god you can't help but trust in god and when you trust in god your mind will be more often than not be stayed on him in whatever situation or place or location you're in whatever stage of life you're at and and that's how anyone can truly be still can have that perfect peace um, because they know God just like you know one of my favorite verses Psalm 46 10 be still how because you know that I'm God be still and know that I'm God so let's put verse 3 together and 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 it makes so much sense now and hopefully this is one of those verses we will memorize you will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because they trust in you Okay, <clears throat> verse 4 is the best advice you can give anyone. Okay, it says, Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. Yah doesn't get tired on you. He doesn't quit on you. He, his love, his patience, his endurance, his faithfulness, his forgiveness, his giving, his working on you and with you, all of this is everlasting. It endures forever. He doesn't quit on you. Um, he never gets tired of you, or sick of you. I mean, think about this for a minute. I was talking about this with somebody the other day. God knew or knows. I don't know what the right verb to use here because he's above time. But God knew or knows every single bad thing that you have ever done. Every single bad thing that you've ever done or said or going to say or do in your life. And he still chose to create you. He loves you. He wants you. He wants you with him in heaven forever. Therefore, trust in the Lord forever. Whatever God is capable of doing, he is capable of doing always and forever. Look at verse 5. It says, For he brings down those who dwell on high. The lofty city, he lays it low. He lays it low to the ground. He brings it down to the dust. So we're not talking about literal cities here, but like the proud, the arrogant, the oppressors of the world. Remember from all the previous chapters, the Egypts of the world, the Tyres of the world, the Babylons of the world. God is always able to easily bring them down. And not only that, but anything that is haughty and prideful in my own heart, if I keep walking with God, and if I maintain that personal relationship with him and I get to know him better and better, he is more than able to bring those lofty high places in my heart down to the ground. He is able to keep us humble, to remove any pride or arrogance from our heart. I mean, he can move mountains, right? He can move the mountains in me. Um, if your mind is stayed on him, which is very good for you. I look at verse 6, it's kind of interesting. It says, 
The foot shall tread it down, the feet of the poor, and the steps of the needy. Again, remember from chapter 25, we talked on the poor and the needy. Who are the, the, the poor and the needy? The poor are the poor in spirit, those who realize that they own nothing, that all is his and from him and for him. And then the needy are those who just really know I need you, Lord. They're the humble ones, okay? Those who cannot do it alone. They know that without God, it's impossible to do anything. I need you. I need your mercy. I need your strength. I need your enlightenment. I need you to make me holy. I need you to make me like your son. I need you to grow and live and do anything good in my life. These are the ones who will be able to dread down the high and lofty places of the world, including treading down on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy remember we thank god for this okay verse 7 it says the way of the just is uprightness those whose mind is stayed on god always live justly always walk and live before god so their way of living whether alone or in front of a million people is uprightness that's like we always tell the kids like that's how you know what's really going on in your heart is how do you behave when nobody sees you how do you behave when you're alone how do you behave if i may say the words in your mind in your thoughts what do you allow yourself to think it, 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 okay it's good that we don't act out on stuff that that it doesn't come out but more importantly god looks at the heart so um their way of living whether alone or in front of a million people is uprightness and why or how is the way of the just is uprightness it says it because god sets their path before them they they take god as their leader as their guide as the one on the front of the of the line uh, they invite god to walk before them and to set their path and they follow him okay it says the way of the just is uprightness almost upright you weigh the path of the just okay you lead us um this reminds me of of the the prayer in the liturgy that we recall sometimes from the Gregorian liturgy when i want to praise straight and for us the way of godliness like you you go before us and this is also when we pray when we say when Abuna says, lead us throughout the way into your kingdom, that word lead us throughout the way into your kingdom is like, it's not just walk before us, it's like grab our hands and pull us and like walk in front of us and we follow you. And how does one invite God to lead their every aspect of their life? The answer is in verses 8 and 9. Amona, can I say something huh? in seven and seven? Yes. I say almost upright, you weigh the path of the just. But in Arabic, it says to my head, mm -hmm. yani you pave the way. Pave. Pave is better. Yeah. Yes. Can Can you explain it more, please, Yani? Okay. Can how do they How do they pave roads? They make it smooth and. Uh, by what? Helpful by uh, by straightening it, adjusting it. Or yes, and kind of treading it down. Say that, Rafat. What? Removing the stones. Yes. So, so paving the way for us is removing the stones and walking on it ahead of us, walking on it before us. Okay. Um, and and the wonderful thing for us orthodox it's um what it says in the song of songs do you remember after the shunamite was dilly dallying and saying like he was like standing all night until the dawn knocking on the door and saying open to me my sister my love my my fair one and she's like i washed my feet i'm already in bed like you know and then like the 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 dew of the morning was dripping from the locks of his hair and then eventually when she went to open the door what happened he was gone and then she's freaking out and she said have you seen the one i love and what do they tell her do you remember in the song of songs probably 
Yes, follow the footsteps of the flock. So he paves the way, so he walks it first. Okay, he shows us what we what we do, and not only he did it in front of us and then le- walks away. Le- he walked it in front of us. He lived it to show us how we live it, and now he's pulling us. If we're clinging onto his hand, he's walking that way ahead of us, like a guide in a forest or something. And even though we are thousands of years behind him physically, in the physical sense, we can still follow because we have the flock that followed him before us, and everybody's pulling the hand of those behind them. That was the thing that I was talking about earlier about keeping the truth. Remember, that was one of the ways we keep the truth. Um, So yeah, paving the way before us. And then we said like, how does one invite God to lead their every aspect of the life? Uh, uh, Isaiah, the prophet answers this in, in, in verses eight and nine. Okay, so there's four points. First of all, it says, yes, in the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you. So the first thing, number one, is that they properly and actively wait on the Lord, as we as we read in the last chapter. It's active waiting, okay? Not just twirling my thumbs. Um, so they wait on the Lord. That's number one. Number two, the desire of our soul is your name and for the remembrance of you. This is the part what uh, Austin was talking about and, and Nicole. Um, somebody said... Sorry, I just to threw away. the Hebrew and it means uh, it translates to make level or to weigh. Very good. I guess it's, you know what it reminds me of? The word weigh, it, it, it's like from weight, like like... You know those big, I don't know what they're called, those big bulldozers that have the big drum in the front that they fill with water? Um, Steamrollers? I don't know what they're called. It's the same word in Proverbs 5, 6. Um, the make what makes straight the path. Uh, oh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, he acknowledge him and okay. he will make your path straight. He will make your it's path straight. He will. He will and that's why I think it uses the word judgment there in verse eight. It's using wisdom language. So I think the translator got it wrong here in English, but only teeny tiny bit wrong. That's awesome. Thank you. It's very helpful. Don't you wish you knew Hebrew and Greek? Like so you can read the Bible and they're like original languages and then you can like uh-huh. really. Not as hard as it seems. <laughs> but yeah. It's all Greek to me, um, but thank God for those uh, technology and ask because well, if one wants to, they can. Okay, so number one is is actively waiting on the Lord. Number two is where it says there in, in verse eight, the desire of our soul is your name and for the remembrance of you. Um, just like we talked about in the previous chapter um, about God's name, that it's a mighty fortress, the righteous run to it and is safe. So it's it is the desire of one's soul to remember God's name as much as possible wherever they're at. Like, like also when I should, oh my, oh my Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. Oh my Lord Jesus Christ, help me. Oh my Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, strengthen me. Oh my Lord Son, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, guide me. Oh my Lord Jesus Christ, comfort me. Oh my Lord Jesus Christ, delight me. Um, Say something, Abuna. Yes. Uh, f- seven and eight together. It came to my mind when when the Shalmite they told her to follow the flock, to follow the steps. Does this mean that Yani, as Jesus suffered for us since his birth till his cross, should we follow him in the same way, in the same pattern? and not to be like in our comfort zone like all other nations or or i'm going so far yeah no of course of course it means this i mean we don't even have to wonder our lord said in luke 9 23 if anyone wants to come after me let him do what do you remember cross and follow deny himself and then carry his cross daily and come and follow me. And what is what is one carry their cross? That means carry the cross you're gonna die on. 
I die in loving, I die in forgiving, and die in submission, I die in uh, 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 obeying, I die in striving, I die in serving, I die in giving, all the stuff. So yes, yes. So waiting on the Lord and then continuous remembrance of God's name and hiding in it. Number three um, is verse nine. With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you early. So this person with all their heart and soul, they desire some time with God to connect with God always at the beginning of their day and at the end of their day, really at all the time in between too. Um, and by the way, this is very difficult to do at first, but it's something we grow in and it becomes a habit. If you read the, um, the, the, the Russian book, The Way of the Pilgrim, like after a lot of practice, it becomes something you do even subconsciously as you're working, as you're driving, as you're whatever, uh, remembering God's name. Um, <clears throat> so all the time between, they grow in keeping their mind and their eyes focused on God, talking to God, mentioning his name, giving thanks to him should be like the very first thing we do as soon as you open your eyes. This is like awesome. I've been working on this lately and it's been... I feel like it changed my whole temperament. I hope I stick with it because it's, it's really cool. As soon as I open my eyes in bed, thank God for something. While you're still in bed, thank God for something. Believe me, you're not going to be able to just limit it to one thing. You'll find them rolling. But just thank, thank God for something. And as you're about to close your eyes and like doze off in bed at night, thank God for something. Um... So mentioning his name and giving thanks to him at night, in the morning, and all the time in between. And then number four, remember we said those are the four things of like um, uh, how to invite God to pave the way before me. Waiting on him actively, uh, the remembrance of his name, um, being mindful of him or recalling him or remembering him, or connecting with him. Even if it's for one or two seconds in the morning and at night. Uh, and in between and then the fourth thing uh, is the last part of verse 9 it says for when your judgments are in the earth the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness so this person spreads God's judgment on earth how through two things two methods two ways through deed and through word and please notice that I said deed first and then we said like how, how the Bible says to do and uh, everything he did and said. Okay, so action is more important than word. So this person shows and demonstrates and spreads God's judgment on earth. A, through their actions and how they behave in front of all people, including how they behave when they're alone in their own chamber of their mind. And B, through their words. They're ready to tell people why they love the way they, the, uh, why they live, the way they live. And uh, they say it in a way that makes people want God and desire intimacy with God too. Okay. Um, okay. Verse 10. Verse 10 warns about how there are some people out there even when you spread and demonstrate God's judgment in front of them, they were still rejected. I mean, human stubbornness sometimes it's like bewildering, really. Okay, so it says, let grace be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. And by the way, this warning is for us too. to not be stubborn. Don't let your pride get the best of you. When, when you are shown God's judgment by other true believers, um, please don't be hard hearted. Okay. Don't be, don't be using Isaiah's words, wicked. Okay. When you see grace, when you see uprightness, when you beheld the majesty of the Lord, please be careful to learn righteousness and to deal justly. This also is referring to the double-minded person. 
the double-minded quote-unquote Christian who goes to the places where God's grace is, like in church or Bible studies or spiritual meetings and stuff like that and the company of the believers, and yet chooses not to live righteously or justly. It's like they go to these things, they participate in these things like as a show, as something to watch, to like go hang out for a little bit and then go live life however I want. They don't apply it. Um, they will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Okay, verse 11. Lord, when your hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they will see and be ashamed for their envy of people. Yes, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. He's still talking about those wicked ones, okay? And as they say here in, in the U.S., some people don't change when they see the light, but they will change when they, what? The heat. When they feel the heat. They won't change when they see the light, but they will change when they feel the heat. God's hand is lifted up, meaning God working all around them, but they don't see it. They explain it away, or they give credit to anything and to and everything but God, Okay. And then the second half of verse 11, it says, it's, it's interesting, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. Did you notice that? Do you see this your here? And it's a capital Y. So the fire of the enemies of God will devour them. Who are the enemies of God? The devil and his demons. These are the true enemies. So number one, the fire is not from God. Okay, it's from his enemies. And also, number two, this, this shows us that God's enemies, the devil and his demons, are dying to destroy us. Roaming about like a roaring lion, seeking whom they may devour, right? But if we walk with God, if we have our mind stayed on him, that's the name of the Lord is a mighty fortress. Okay, It's a high tower we can hide in. Their fire, the fire of God's enemies, cannot touch us. Okay? Oh, they sure try. For sure they try. Um but we are kept in perfect peace that fire cannot touch us uh, it cannot devour us in shame as it says in the verse and this takes us to verse 12 it says lord uh, yes go ahead uh, for verse 11 uh -huh. uh, maybe and, and the fire of god's enemies means the fire that was prepared for satan and his angels rather than mean mm. like the source of the fire is still God, but it wasn't prepared for human unless he chose to. It was the fire of his enemies is the fire that he prepared for his enemies. I don't know. That's a good point. Maybe. So it's is the either the, the fiery ways. darts of the, coming from the enemies or, or the fire that was prepared yeah for the enemy that's mentioned in Matthew 25 um, I, I think I want to work both ways the, either way the, the good news or the important news for us is that if we walk with God and our mind is stayed with him um, whatever that fire the bad fire <laughs> is uh, we're, we're shielded from it we're protected from it there's also the story I forget who but when God caused the want the enemies of Israel to burn themselves to the ground because they were so afraid of the shouting of the Israelites. And so like the story, maybe the st a story that Isaiah was, was raised with is the story of the enemies of God encamped around Jerusalem, burning themselves to the ground. I don't remember that. Or is it in the Valley? I forget who I'll find it. I'll, I'll link it. The fire of the valley of Gehenna. Okay, when you can, when you find us, let us know when you find it. Um, verse 12, it says, Lord, you were established peace for us. You have also done all our works in us. Those who walk with God and have their mind stayed on God now become instruments of righteousness in the hands of God. Isn't the, the wording interesting? Because you say what? Um, you have also done all. You would think it would say your work in us, right? 
but it says you have done you've also done all our works in us so those who walk with God and have their minds stayed on God become instruments of righteousness in the hands of God whatever our good works or our good deeds are it is God who has done those things in us and through us to will and to act according to his good purpose um, it reminded me of of Romans six thirteen, when St. Paul is, is exhorting us do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin you know, instruments, tools in the hands of the enemy, but present yourself to God being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Present yourself to be like tools in, in God's hands so that he can work those good works that we do, like so that he's, he's the one doing it. Those who walk with God and have their minds stayed on him become tools and instruments of righteousness in his hands. <clears throat> In verse 13 it says, O Lord our God, masters beside you have had dominion over us, but you only, by you only, we make mention of your name. Yeah, those other masters had power over us, but you are the only master that we love. You're the only master who, whose glorious and powerful name we love to mention and we desire to commemorate. And it, uh, it goes on sorry. Verse, yes sorry but now can i go back to 12 please yes uh if you look in the arabic say ya rab taj'al lana salaman la'anna kull a'malana sana'aha lana sana'aha lana you remember this sentence uh, i used to say it i i was not remembering where is it always yeah, and how i was wondering how all our knees you did it for us not it's not written needs here it's written amalana. our works our works yani i think as soon as he smells something good in us then he will he will help us he will hold our lands to continue i feel it more in arabic than in english so the more we walk with god the more and more i become christ-like i start going about doing good it's like how he would speak, I would speak. How he would act, I would act. Mm -hmm. yes. So so really we become like tools in his hands that he can reach to other people with. He can heal others with. He can uh, love on others through us. Yes. So, so we're working, but he's the one doing the work within us and through us for others. Sabuna, uh -huh. uh, on, on, on 13, it said you... But by you, uppercase you, only we make mention of your name. And that means because he, he's the one that has to lead us, because it's by you, we make mention of your name. So, so unless we, you do something. Go ahead. Go ahead and finish. Unless, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not going to be on our own power. We, we have to get power from him so we can mention his name exactly every time i do something good for the right purpose it's not me it's me simply submitting to god and he's the one who's doing it in me and through me and for me <laughs> but it's him doing it um like i like in the letter you say we offer to you your gifts from what is yours for everything concerning everything and then everything when i love when okay think about it this way i talked about this before that every commandment in the bible it does not come to us naturally it's not human nature our human nature is an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth it's not to forgive it's not to turn the other cheek our human nature our broken nature is to be selfish and to hoard and to take um our human nature is yani it's not very good and that's why i said any any christian cannot say this is how i am this is how god made me this is how i'm born get used to it no you, we can't say this as christians okay uh, so so whenever i do things that go against my broken human nature who's the one who's doing it 
It is God. Yes, I, 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 I'm taking a part in the action by my, sub, my submitting to his will and letting him move me. It's almost like, this is going to sound really dumb, okay? But you know how when, when, uh, when couples get married and the wedding reception, so they have like the bride hold the knife to cut the cake and then the groom holds her hand. Austin Nicole, remember that? <laughs> Recent. Um, and then they're like, they're cutting it together, okay? So you can see like, he's our, he's our bridegroom, so he's holding our hands and we're cutting the cake together, but we have to do our part. We have to be willing to submit to him. We have to let him move us. We have to let him will and to act according to his good purpose. I have to hold the knife and put it on the cake and then let him do that. And even the desire to do this, he put in us. And this protects us. This protects us immensely so that I don't think that, Yani, like he said, if you do everything, say we're just unprofitable servants. This is not self-deprecation. No, this is to, to always remember that me, what am I? It is God who works in me. Um, and so protect us from arrogance and pride. Uh, go ahead, Munir, and then I heard another sound. Oh, maybe Maryam. Okay, go ahead, say that. No, it was just a uh, It is actually related to this uh, verses that uh, that uh, they said, uh, O oh Lord, masters beside you have had dominion over us. Uh, it reminds me what in uh, Luke 19, 14, when there was one of the Proverbs that the Lord said that uh, there was a king, and then uh, his citizen said, uh, "We will not have this war reign over us." So they rejected his reign. Mm. So here, uh, the reverse what happened with was in this verse is that we want the Lord to reign on us, and yeah. uh, like that, what can help us to grow. But when they said and uh, look that we will not have uh, this, this king one, reign yeah. on us, yeah. that that is a rejection, and this what will end uh, into condemnation because that's exactly the uh, blasphemy against the the Holy Spirit who want to reign on us. Yeah. So that's connected to it. Yeah. And and you know what this is exactly like the the bond servant. Remember, so the bond servant says, I love this master. I like this master. I want him to be my master forever. So they go and like he, he puts his ear on the doorpost, the cross, and he pierces it with the awl. And khalas, you become a bond servant, like a servant by choice. I want to be the servant or the slave of this master because um, it's the best thing for me. Um, good comments. Okay, verse 14, it says that they are dead they will not live, they are deceased, they will not rise. Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. You and only you are the everlasting one, uh, as we read in the beginning of, as we read in the ever, uh, beginning of, of the chapter. Uh, all else fades away. And then verse 15, so verse 14 was really a continuation of the same sentence in, in, in verse 13. But verse 15 is saying, all the blessings are from you, O Lord. It says, you have increased the nation, O Lord. You have increased the nations. You are glorified. You have expanded all the borders of the land. And when God's blessings increased, the people did what? We've read this in history, which repeats itself. Whenever God's blessing increased, the people turned their back on him. And then what happened to them as a result? God allowed them to get in trouble in order to chastise them, to bring them back. And that's why it says in verse um, 16, after God blessed them, it says, Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out their prayer when your chastening was upon them. As a woman in labor and pain, they cried out to you. I, I, I mentioned this before to others. I say, Yadi, if I am going to get close to God and I'm going to pray really seriously with God and really connect with God and focus on God only when I'm going through storms, what message am I giving God? 
God send the storms because I'm stubborn ox and and that's the only time I'm going to connect with you and that's the only time I'm going to be serious in my relationship with you. But if I run to God, connect with him, pray to him, like really be one with him, have my mind stayed on him during the good times and all that stuff, God will not have to resort to allowing those things in my life. So so yani we 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 have a certain level of control over things. And then... <clears throat> um, Abuna? Uh-huh. So how do we go from only going to God whenever we actually need help to going to God all the time just because we love Him? We start. Um, we start it's it's self training it takes like i said it goes against our broken nature our, our broken nature wants to eat and drink and be merry right let's let's do this and live because tomorrow we die so it requires work at first just like the jesus prayer oh my lord jesus christ son of the living god have mercy on me a sinner it's hard to keep reminding myself to this, to say this and you'll you practice it and you'll see after a few times i'll be doing something as well oh when did I stop saying it? Like I stopped saying it. And then you have to go back at it again. But after time, it becomes a habitual thing. It's a continuous thing. So I need to feed on him, on his word, Bible, sacraments, confession, communion, Bible studies, sermons, spiritual books, all the stuff. I can continuously doing all this so that it becomes second nature to me. I hear stories about people who are really godly or like some priests or nuns or monks who like maybe are sick or something and they go to the hospital and they say how while they're still under anesthesia or while they're like waking up from anesthesia or whatever they're like saying prayers or praises or something and they're like even when they're like unconscious if you will why because this whole time they've been doing it day and night it takes a life long and thank god gave us a life <laughs> to practice this and to acquire it and to grow in it from glory also to glory. Buna, uh -huh. also buna, uh, reminding ourselves all the time about the source of the gifts because if if we if we set our eyes on the gifts we love the gifts but we need to love the source of the gifts yes uh, so this way even in, in the time of peace and tranquility we we will always attribute the good things, the good situation we are in to the beneficent God. And this way we will love him, not his gift. Very us. good. So you, you bring up a very good point. What are the three things that God told us to do always? All the time. Pray. Pray, Pray always. What else? Give thanks always. Always, always give thanks in everything. So it's like always and in everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And what? Always. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. What? Rejoice. Pray always. Give thanks always. Fadwas got it. Bravo. Rejoice always. When you think about it, the only way to do these three things if they are the same thing. How can I pray always? I, if I ask God for everything I can think of and everyone I can think of under the sun, I'll be done maybe in a half an hour or one hour, right? If I pray for every family, every friend, every acquaintance, every situation, every work, every country, every nation, every condition, uh, try it. I mean, you're going to run out of stuff in about an hour or so. So how can I pray always? By now... By praying, by giving thanks. Rila Krafat was saying, recalling the many graces and the wonderful mercies of God. Just sitting there and saying, God, and, and instead of saying, God, thank you for this. No, no, no. God, say, you do this. You have done this. You chose to do this. You know, like, and, and, and when you think about it, a lot of the liturgies are like that. You have cre like the Gregorian liturgy. Oh, my goodness. Like, we're going to hear this, God willing, in a few weeks in the in the feast. You have created me where then I was not. You have, 
offered all the ways of, of righteousness for me. You have bandaged my wounds. You have given me the gift of speech. You put everything under my authority. You like just to sit there and recount the mercies of God. Now that one, he can do it 24-7. You won't run out. <laughs> to sit there and recall all that God does for you. And notice how when a person does this genuinely, all the worries are gone. All the depressions are gone. All the anxieties are gone. And this will lead to rejoicing always. So praying always means giving thanks always, which will lead to rejoicing always. Um, okay, let's go back. We have a Can I also mention one thing too? Sure, Mary. I think um, if we were to just run to God only during the storms, hmm. it's a very false relationship. It would be like, um, you know, running to your best friend only when you're in trouble. At that point, is that really a friendship? Yeah, I mean, no. there's no conversation. It's just running for help and, and never thanking or talking to him yeah. or asking him or or whatever the case is. It's it's a it's a false relationship. Yeah. Then then I'm an opportunistic parasite. <laughs> I'm not a friend of God. Um, right on. OK. And then um, Isaiah makes a confession in verse 18. OK. We're crying out as a woman in labor too, because why we have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. We didn't want the believers, uh, we didn't, uh, I mis mistyped something. Uh, we didn't warn and deliver anyone. Um, those who live by the earth and for the earth that we mentioned in the previous chapter, we did not save them. We did not get them to change their ways and to come to the Lord. Um, and then lastly, the message of hope in verse 19, it says, Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall rise. I love that. Remember, this is Old Testament. This is, was way before uh, Jesus came in the resurrection and all that stuff. With my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead, like the sprout, like herbs. Okay, Those who are dead physically, and those who are dead intellectually, those who are dead emotionally and psychologically, those who are dead spiritually, God is able to raise them up, to raise them up in the resurrection of repentance and is able to raise them up in the resurrection of that day, of the second coming. The dew, remember, what is dew? It's water. And usually what is water referring to in the Bible? Yes. The Holy Spirit. For those who don't know, by the way, and they go, why does it want to sprinkle water on the church after communion? What is that? Does anybody know? My clothes muted. Blessing. Blessing. Okay. Why do I need the blessing? I just had God in me, the body and the blood. Joy. Or Holy Spirit. Ah, uh, well, if you keep guessing enough, you'll come up with one of them. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so what what happened? And remember, the liturgy is reliving everything, like reliving the New Testament. Right? We go through our Lord. We go through creation. We go through um, the the Last Supper. We go through uh, Jesus dying for us, and we go through the the resurrection. He rose from the dead on the third day. Now, after this and after the Last Supper, and he died and resurrected, what happened? Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. And that's why, like, when water is a representative of the Holy Spirit. So the end of the liturgy is basically when, when Abuna sprinkled the water on the people, it's a remembrance of the Holy Spirit falling on us. And it says what? Go and do likewise. Go, teach them, baptize them, and tell them all that I have told you, and lo, I'm with you until the end of the earth. Um, 
our church is so rich and deep and romantic. It's just that if we take the time to learn and understand what's going on, it's it's uh, really amazing. So dew is the Holy Spirit. It's like it's gentle water. It's comforting water. It's nourishing water to the earth, but it's not like harsh water. It's not like the heavy rains because rain is not the Holy Spirit. Rain is like more of like the, the, the troubles of the world, okay? The heaviness that presents the struggles. So even though the gate is narrow and the path is difficult and few choose it, God is able to increase the nation. Again, to increase the nation, like he says it twice, and to make the believers thousands of thousands and 10,000 times 10,000, as it says in, in Revelation, that you cannot even count, even though the gate is narrow and the, and the path is difficult. And if you choose it. How does one make himself or herself one of those whom God will raise up in the resurrection of repentance and in the resurrection of the second coming? We read that in the next passage in the last couple of verses of the chapter. So I'll need somebody to read verses uh, 20 and 21 real quick. We're almost done. We'll be done on time. Huh? Somebody read 20 and 21. I'll read. Thank you. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants for the earth uh, of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. Thank you. When we enter our chambers to connect with God, we hide in him. We hide, we take shelter from the bombardments of the fiery darts of the enemy and from the attacks of the world and the prince of this world. Enter your chambers is not just physical chambers. It's not just go to your home altars, go to your room and shut the door. No, but it's also like enter the chambers of your heart where God rests. I mean, I don't know if you've tried this, but you can have some seriously intimate, quiet, peaceful moments with God in the midst of like a noisy, clangy wedding reception. Like among when you're like sitting with like 300 people or 500 people, or whatever, you can just like, I don't know, tune all this stuff out and just connect with God into your into your inner chamber. Um, when you want to meet with him and to connect with him in the chambers of your heart, uh, wherever you may be physically. Now, can you remember like a couple of examples of those who hid and were saved? Is it uh, Hannah, a mother of Samuel? How did she hide? When she was praying silently. Okay. Yes. She, w she went to God's house and she was praying. And Eli thought she was drunk. Okay. Who else? The Passover. Excellent. The Passover. God told the people to go and to hide in their house. During the Passover, uh, the people of Israel, when they hid in their homes and covered their doors, doorposts and lentils with the blood of the Passover lamb. So... You can go and hide in the blood of the lamb when under attack from the enemy. And you go and pray to God and ask him for forgiveness and ask him for to cover you again with his redeeming blood. Very good. What else? Who else hid or took shelter? David. How? When he hid in the shelter from the face of uh, Saul in the cave. Very good. In the cave from Saul. <clears throat> Who else hid in a rock? Elijah, actually, and Moses. Yes. <laughs> you know who else took shelter or hid? Noah and the ark, which is always a symbol of the church. The wise one who is able to hide from any storm and go connect with God at any time could even be while another person is yelling at you or attacking at you, you're able to like just go hide and take shelter in God. Um, these are great examples. So let us try to remember or maybe even memorize this verse 2620, 
which is come my people enter your chambers shut your doors behind you and remember these could be just the doors of your heart or the doors of your ear it's too bad we don't have ear lids or like we have eyelids <laughs> that would be cool um but then it would be trouble when we have like teenage kids and because they can close the ears but anyway um, when I so it says just something? second please so it's uh, like that verse come my people enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you hide yourself as it were for a little moment a little moment until the indignation is passed if we do this um it'll it'll go quickly the other verse that i i hope we try to remember is verse three you will keep him in perfect peace or her whose mind is stayed on you because he or she trusts in you if you want that perfect peace uh ayo mama go ahead Esther, you're muted. Esther, unmute. Taib, while she's figuring out, I'm done uh, with um, chapter uh, 26. So before we uh, part ways until next Thursday, I want you to tell me something that you've noticed something that you learned something that you liked something that you're gonna try to take with you from this chapter i uh, i really like the analogy you mentioned abuna about the bridegroom holding the hand of the bride cutting the cake really uh, top quiz yes yes <laughs> i really love it because <laughs> because jesus always referred to as a bridegroom and our soul is, is, is a bride so mm. it, is, it is very very applicable to show that every good thing is done through the hand of God but at the same time we have to do our uh, our part mm. I really love that thank you I say something Abuna yes go ahead uh, can I consider Jesus Christ at the end of the day when he used to go to the mountain alone mm. and pray to his father this could be a good example for all of us and to be silent and pray to him in our hearts yes this is actually it's 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 a great proof to how nourishing and satisfying and joy making and like rejuvenating that quiet time with God is because you think after all the service and after all the work you know like the, the okay, if you can imagine the physical exhaustion but then he still has to do this why there's something in it that's like just so it's a must it's like somebody who's super 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 exhausted and had eaten all day I don't know some people I guess can go to sleep without eating but like they still got to eat something they, they still got to put some nourishment in their stomach especially if they're going to start their day running 100 miles an hour again. Um, just to, to, something to grow in, to taste and see how sweet God is and how good he is. Hmm. Who else? I have a question. Yes. So you mentioned a little bit about how um, we choose to become servants of God. But um, I never really got the idea of us becoming servants. What does that really mean exactly? Um, to become a slave of God. To, to become basically, okay, think of an actual master and slave or servant. The word servant is a little gentler than slave, but think of master and slave, but this slave wants to be the slave of that master. It's like a bond servant, okay? Whatever the master wants, I do. Wherever he wants to go, I follow, I go with him. Like he he has absolute reign and control over my life. Um, I do the work that he wants me to do. And I do it not expecting like oh you're awesome you're whatever because that's what a servant does really i think also i'm thinking a lot as i answer you 
um, <clears throat> like when Jesus said, you cannot have two masters. You, you'll, you'll either love one or hate the other, or you'll uh, obey one and despise the other one. Like, so in order for me to be a slave of God, I have to be freed from my slavery to anything else, to myself, to money, to uh, friends, to the world, to possessions, to positions, um, because I cannot go be a slave to one master unless if this current master releases me, right? And if that master doesn't release me, I have to break free from them and to go make myself a slave to that master. I hope this helps and uh, I welcome anybody if they want to, to add to it. I think what confuses me is um, I always thought of like a servant or a slave always fulfilling the needs of their master and just I know that like God doesn't have needs so what is then our purpose for God? Well fulfilling the wants of their master maybe that's better. What is the purpose what? What was the last part you said? What is the purpose of us becoming servants for God? Okay. So, God said that he desires something. So, if you will, God said, I need something. I mean, I'm blaspheming right now. He didn't say, I need something. But the Bible says that God desires what? Our love. Everybody be saved. Are you, uh, that one. That all are saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So... What does God want or what does God need? Let's 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 mention this list. He wants us to repent. He wants us to love one another. He wants us to forgive. He wants us to serve and to love sacrificially. He wants us to evangelize and to bring as much harvest as possible because the labors are few. He wants us to pray always, thank always, rejoice always. So there's so many things that our master wants or desires. So, yalla, if I really deem him to be my master and I'm his slave or his servant, I need to roll my sleeves and get to working. <laughs> um. it's, it's like, Abuna, it is like uh, a master asking his servant to prepare a dinner, and he does prepare dinner and ask him to set the table and put the dinner on the table. And the servant does this, but then the master tells him, okay, sit and eat. So, uh, that's exactly what we do when we serve in God. We do things that is only us and the others that benefit from it. God does not need us, does not benefit anything of us. He just wants us to serve him in order to benefit from the, our thoughts. Yeah. Just like every commandment, I've said this before, that every commandment to rule that the parents make for the kids are for the good of the kids. So every commandment that God told us is for our own good and for our own benefit. Because like Luji said, he doesn't need anything. And the amazing thing about our master is he says, I don't call you slaves anymore. I don't call you servants anymore. I call you what? Friends. I call you fellow heirs. I'll call you my brothers and sisters. See how awesome he is? And that's why, like we read in this chapter, we love him to be our master. We love to be his slaves. Uh, it's the I best thing for us. Go ahead, Mari. Uh, also to answer the question of why we have to be servants or why we sh should choose to be servants, I see it the other way, not only because God desires the other people to, to go to him. It's also how much I enjoy my life with God. Mm. And I wish everybody around me feel the same joyful I feel. So that that's my opinion with serving like i serve because i wish everybody see god as to much as i this. see him yeah yeah, yeah. you yes. reminded me of who said this pascal i don't remember but he said like if christianity is wrong i don't want to be right <laughs> right because it's it's so awesome there's also um our personal personally when we first got to austin uh abuna and his wife you were the first ones to show up and say hi to us and you served us and you brought us dinner and it got me thinking if god is love and we serve god um, then we show love to each other and we show love to god and we show love to others on behalf of god but if the enemy and if the world is 
hatred and evil and not caring about things when we serve those things when we hate or we're evil or we don't care about somebody we end up serving those as our master huh. and um, i think about uh um in church uh sam and iman uh yeah. iman yeah yeah iman. 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 Uh, when we went over there to their house they just kept serving us food and they just kept bringing uh and bringing us drinks and I, we never had people host us kind of like that in that same sense ever before and i was able to tell that to somebody else later i was able to share that with a young man at a, at a store when we had like i was sitting down with him for like three hours i was just able to tell him about the hospitality i experienced from the people in this church and he's like i've never i've never even heard of that from a from christians that they would show that kind of hospitality, that they would kind of, they would just be that giving and that loving that, and they would serve you like that. And he even said, serve. Uh, and and the, 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 that's, that's really so profound because the person who gets it and sees that this person in front of me is the son or the daughter of my master, which means what? That he or she is also my master. If I'm a, if I'm a slave in somebody's palace, Okay, and famous name of that king, and then this king has like princes and princesses. They also are my master, and it delights my heart to serve my master's children, just like it delights my heart to serve him, because that puts a smile on his face. That makes him happy, and I serve God in in them. Um, there was um. I was with Yanni yeah, with 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 somebody who's who's uh, some years ago whose mom has some like severe advanced Alzheimer's, and and I've noticed like when going into the room into the 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 it wasn't a hospital it was like a like assisted living place or whatever. Um, the people that went in, the person that went in, did a prostration in front of the bed in front of his that that person's mom just like they would do in front of the altar because he jesus himself said this right i was hungry you fed me i was thirsty you gave me to drink matthew 25 this one he told the people come into the kingdom i was a stranger you took me in i was naked you clothed me i was a prisoner you visited me and and when you think about it evangelism <laughs> except for saint peter in his first sermon evangelism does not occur in like big groups or big droves of people evangelism occurs one person at a time it's in that one-on-one -on -one relationship when they taste god in you when they see the love of god coming that i, I don't want anything i just want to love you M loving on you makes me happy and people are like so thirsty for this people are, uh, this stuff doesn't exist anymore except by christians we really need to do uh, more of that. I was talking with a young lady from uh, from Houston, who's considering orthodoxy, and and <laughs> she was rebuking me. She was like, "Why aren't you all like, like talking, giving, you know, passing and preaching orthodoxy all over so much more?" Um, we really need to do more of this. There's a lot of people who are searching for this. May God help us to do that. <laughs> Alrighty, um, any other comments or anything y'all liked that stood out from this chapter before we close? And just real quick, I wanna, um, just about becoming instruments for the Lord and allowing him to, you know, really to, for us to be one with him. It, it just, I find the irony of those who talk about God as, someone who's trying to control people like a puppet master we're really the ones that we we allow him or we don't allow him and then that reminds me of psalm 2 when it says like why do the nations rage and the people plod vain things and trying to break the the cords and the lord will laugh right in derision it's like he's laughing because he's like i'm not forcing myself upon you I never was. It, it's it's all your choice, um, and I, I just I think about that, and it just it's such a beautiful relationship that he allows us to have with him. It's funny how crafty the enemy is in getting to people. I mean, he is the liar and the father of lies. 
he gets people to look at it as, as Christianity as constricting and oppressing and binding my freedom when it's the absolute opposite. It's freeing and it's and it, and, and invigorating and um, anyway, we just need to do and to act and to speak uh, like he wants us to so that people can see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven, as it says in Matthew 5. Good comment. Thank you. All right, let's pray. We went over time as usual. Sorry about that. Um, okay, who'll, uh, who'll pray for us tonight? <clears throat> Austin or Nicole? Let's do that. One of the new guys. I don't know what we're doing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you so much for everyone being here. Thank you for uh, learning how to pray and how to thank you in all things. Thank you for the promises that you give us in Isaiah. Thank you for showing us the, the song of your salvation. Thank you for the church that we have the opportunity to love you and to love others. We thank you in everything and pray in the name of your Son. Amen. Through the intercession of St. Mary, our King Jemichael, and all you saints and martyrs who please you from the beginning, the mighty power of your love giving cross, the blessings of the days of this nativity fast, and the blessed month of Kiak. Please, the Lord, make us ready to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only begotten Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Jesus Thank Spirit. you all so much. See you all next Thursday, God willing. Thank you. Or at church. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. The person See who was you. looking for the verse or looking for how to pray when you don't know what to pray, there's a verse, Romans 8, 26, that Nicole reminded me of, which says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes through us through wordless grounds. So just spend time in prayer with God. One of the um, really awesome things is, is just trying to stay quietly in God's presence and letting the Holy Spirit do the work. It takes some practice, but it's very fulfilling. Okay, thank you all. See you next time. Bye-bye.